Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at Bluka. So Bluka is a set of wargaming rules. It's uh, Grand Tactical is, is, I think, the word they use to describe it in the in the book. It's core level engagements. So the uh, the, the base you use, the, the unit size you use, is the brigade. Um, it's uh, two to four thousand men. Um, not all armies have cores, but it's it's you know multiple divisions. Then if you if you want to go a bit that way. So um, the way these reviews work, I haven't done one in a while, but um, it's a good time to do one again. So the way these reviews work is five good, uh, three. Eh, Things that I would sort of change that I don't really like that people have said to me that they're not really fans of and then wrap it all up with what makes the game unique although in this case I'm going to put what makes the game unique at the start because that actually is a has an impact on the rest of it so on so let's start with that so what makes Bluka unique well random activations and when I say random activations I don't mean Okay, I want to activate unit X, roll a dice, ah, oh, they failed, my turn's over, or something like that. Not like that, I hate those type of things. It also doesn't mean dealing cards, like a sharp practice would, where you deal cards and then blue blue one, red five, go back and forth like that. No, what you do is, uh, your opponent will roll dice secretly, uh, depending on the size of the game, it's normally 2 or 3d6, and they'll look at the value and keep that covered. And that is the amount of moves you have before your turn is over. Uh, moves not combat, so if you're engaged in combat, you can fire no matter what. But uh, this is, uh, you know, moving your units around, initiating charges, that sort of things. So you don't know how many moves you have. Your opponent does. So they can bait you <laughs> in the in the sort of is that meta gaming? No, I don't think that's meta gaming. But they can sort of um, use their foreknowledge to bait you and say, well, you know, like, oh, that, that that that's a weak unit there. I bet you could smash that, knowing that you have very few activations so if you focus too much on that then they'll get the other flank that sort of thing so uh, i think that's it, it, that really makes it unique in that um you have this random number of moves that your only your opponent knows about so you're trying to you might rush and do 15 things and then you you've got 18 activations so you didn't need to do that or you might think you've got seven you've got two or you've got three you know it's it's it's, it's really cool uh, so we'll do two good three bad three good i think that's that'll work so uh so the first first point concealed units all of your uh units there that you can be units or cards the the book actually says using miniatures is an advanced step up and the cards are actually quite good because you have all your stats just right there you don't have to put a marker and then cross reference so um, i've actually made up some some cards they give you blanks so it's, it's not that hard anyway um the the concealed movement is good because if you're concealed and you don't come within uh, four base widths, which is 12 inches, but I oh, wonder where that's going to come up. If you don't go within 12 of the enemy, you can um, you can move further. So it, as long as you're not engaged, you have an extra movement. Uh, this is similar. I think um, Ultra of Freedom has a similar thing where if you're uh, making reserve moves, that sort of thing. Anyway, so while you're concealed, that means that you know where your army is, but your opponent doesn't. So that big strong force on the right, is that just a whole bunch of conscripts you're planning to attack you know on the flank with or is that a strong cavalry force that unit moving back and forth behind the lines rushing to sort of find a place where it can plug a gap or running away from something is that uh, the, the example they use in the book is is that the old guard or is that conscript so it's it's really cool to have this this mystery behind the thing and uh, it's even better if your opponent doesn't have access to your army list and and can actually you know doesn't know what units you have Number two, the rule book is very clear. Uh, it's very, very clear. Uh, there's an FAQ included at the back, but uh, I, I doubt you could get confused with this rule book if you were. Um, uh, well, you, you can get confused, but I doubt you could get utterly lost with uh, using this rule book. It, it's extremely clear. It's very well laid out. It's very easy to read. Uh, they don't use some weird font. They don't have like a weird back color on the page. Uh, you can get it in PDF or hardback format. Uh, I got the, the PDF because. Okay, on to the negatives. The first negative is the term base width. And this is an issue I have with games like Saga, with games like this. Don't, don't, uh, uh, Impetus, Impetus does this too. Don't give me base width or base depth as a measurement. Just give me three inches. Base width, how much is a base width? Three inches. Okay, three, just put three. If I could go into that document, control F, B, W, three, and just change them all, I would do it. 
It's not. I, I understand why they do it. They do it so that you can game at, at different scales, but it gets incredibly frustrating. It's, that's not why Saga does it. Saga does it to be weird, but anyway. Saga has like V, S, S, M, L for their ranges instead of just 2, 4, 6, and 12. That that boggles my mind. Anyway, I don't like base widths because just I you can scale games without needing the term base width in there. I mean, people do it for literally every other game out there. I don't know why. Yeah, You can play... Napoleon at war on 20 mils using 6 mil figures and all you do is halve everything you don't need the term base width I, I, I understand why they've done it and I understand that it makes it a little bit easier for, for people to change the thing around it, it drives me nuts <laughs> because I keep having to remember 3 inches and it it, yeah, it just it, 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 it's just one of those things that, that I have a pet peeve number 2 if you get infantry in a, in a building oh my goodness they're never leaving they're never leaving that bit oh, they are just rock solid and this basically means that if someone garrisons a building, then you just stay away from it. You can't even pound it with artillery because there's there's nothing artillery can do. Normally, uh, infantry that are massed together by being prepared or, or prepared as a state you can go into anyway, like forming squares. Normally, infantry, which are very concentrated, get penalties when artillery fires at them, not in buildings. Uh, you have a negative to be shot at. You have a negative to be assaulted. Uh, your opponent has massive negatives to assault you. It's being in a building is way too powerful. And in the Napoleonic Wars, these buildings become focal points for the battle. People fight over them. They pour men in. Both sides pour men in. Um, don't watch my series on La Haison if you want to see how a normal battle works for a garrison. La Haison and uh, Ugamon is very different. Uh, Lingley beforehand is a much better example of, of fighting over a, a built-up area. Um, those, the, uh, Waterloo is a massive exception to this rule generally built up areas are like they, they attract soldiers to them and uh, in, in blue caves it's, it's almost like they repel soldiers away from them so I, I would like to see those toned down just a touch to make them uh, still still worthwhile occupying but maybe they come with a few negatives or maybe just not so many bonuses number three the book doesn't actually give you any scenarios and I went on the website and I couldn't find any scenarios on his website uh, I did find some scenarios on a brilliant website which I'll link in the description below uh, but they give you how to make your own scenarios, and they give you, uh, what's it, Fontos de Anoro, I can't pronounce it, the, the one um, before Terra Verdres, where, where um, um, Wellesley is, is fighting Marmont up, um, just above Port uh, in Portugal there, just above Lisbon, anyway. They give you that one, but it, it's, it would have been nice to just have like th four or five, maybe not even the big ones, you don't have to do Alcelets or something like that, but you know, Marengo, Leipzig would be cool, uh, not Borodino, Borodino is a bit big, but, but you know what I mean, like just like three or four battles. Um, they, I, I understand that, you know, make your own stuff up, but for the first few games, you don't really want to be designing, you know, entire scenarios. So thankfully there is, there are people out there online who have done that for you. So, um, so that's what I'll be doing for the first few games. Um. Okay, back to the good points. Sorry, bounced around, but I needed to get that first thing in because that changed, that sort of impacts the rest of this. Number three, your artillery is limited. So your there are two types of artillery. There is attached artillery, which is sort of the British method of uh, taking a few guns and attaching them to a, to a brigade or taking a few guns here and, and putting maybe putting a battery with a division and letting them subdivide. Um, so the general rule is for every three attached guns is one massed battery. So you can actually take a massed battery and, and split it out among your units. Uh, all attached guns do is give you an extra dice, an extra um, dice to hit which is cool, uh, and then you have the, the mass batteries. If you're in a mass battery, you have limited ammunition. Um, that doesn't mean that these guns only fired five times during the entire battle, but this is five times when the guns really ramp up their firing. So you could be firing all day, just harassing, you know, a couple of shots, a couple of shots here, a couple of shots there, but then for 20 minutes, you really need to ramp it up because there's an attack going in and you have to, you have to really focus. So that's, that simulates that happening. Uh, when your artillery runs out, it just retires. But uh, the attached artillery does not ever run out of ammunition because they're not doing that sort of thing. So it's it's really cool to see that. Um, it's almost like having you. It's almost like having a sort of like five cards you can play to sort of do a lot of damage to the enemy. But um, you have to be very cagey with your artillery, which is which is really cool. Number four, they give you army lists. And these, these are, they're mainly given for points match games, but I don't think many people would actually play those, but they're also given to help balance scenarios. But the main thing I like about them is they have the commanders in there. 
So if you have uh, Saratha Wellesley, uh, you can, in your scenario, you can just take his command thing out and just put it in your scenario. You don't have to come up with all rules for, for Saratha. They give you all the way, you know, this is, if you want to take him in your army, you get these bonuses. Uh, so he lets you place an extra piece of terrain. And uh, he is a very inspiring general, that sort of thing. So it's, it's really cool to see that they have got the commander stuff in there. Um, the the army lists are also good because it's got um, rough guides to how you should build a unit. So, for example, a French infantry unit looks like this. A French conscript unit looks like this. If you want to add this or this to it, that's probably acceptable. But, you know, don't go adding this to a French conscript unit. Don't make them shock troops, you know. Maybe make them uh, not conscripts and you could just sort of have more elite troops, maybe over strength. But uh, don't go giving them nonsense, you know, overpowered special rules. Although I doubt anyone's actually building points match games for this in the same way they would for something like Napoleon at War, which is almost designed as a points match first, historical recreation second. Number five, there is an inbuilt campaign in the book. Uh, quite a huge chunk of the book is taken up by a campaign. And part of, me, part of me thinks it's a negative, and I would love to have seen that section taken up by scenarios instead. But the campaign is actually really good because it lets you generate your own scenarios. Uh, so when I say campaign, it's actually a like a grid. Like a, a, I think it's like a 10 by 5 grid with a map on it and you literally just move your armies and your columns around. You move your, your cores and your divisions around this map, which is really cool. And I, I, I do like that it's in there just because you don't always want to just rock up and play. You don't want to spend ages researching some historical scenario or you don't want to have to... We've done Leipzig five times already. Can, I, can, we, can we do something else, you know? Oh, yes, but we don't want to go and research these other battles. Or, or, yeah, but the stuff I have painted is only good for this one thing. So it's, um, so the campaigns are really good because you can just pick up and just go. And, and, okay, we're in Spain. Here's this division. What if instead of going straight for um, Salamanca, this had happened? Or what if instead of going straight for Badajov, they had done this instead? Or what if Badajov had been a failure and the British had to retreat? And here's this campaign you can set up. So I, I do like that they've included the campaign system. It's really cool. So that was the review of Bluka. I, I quite enjoyed this when I played it before. And I'm going to have to uh, get some uh, opponents and, and have a few more games. Uh, I've done some quick cards up. I have some miniatures, but I don't think I'll be using them for Bluka. These are more for Napoleon at War uh, and sharp practice. So uh, thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day.